adaptarnos a los nuevos tiempos, reinventarnos, de desaparecer eh, para crear un nuevo sistema moderno y eficaz que ya se entiende por todas partes. My name is Michael Stock. I'm a professor of film here at SciArc. I have a very special guest. His name is Jan Harlan, the producer for Stanley Kubrick from 1975 until his death in 1999, executive producing such films as Barry Lyndon, The Shining, Eyes Wide Shut, and of course, Full Metal Jacket. Welcome today, Jan. I'm delighted to be here. First time downtown Los Angeles. I know Los Angeles quite well, but only the other side. And uh, it's very exciting, yes. The first project you were supposed to work on with Kubrick was... Napoleon. Napoleon, can you Napoleon tell us... Napoleon there, he was about. a great scholar of the whole period, French Revolution to the end of you know, Congress in Vienna, 1815. I had known him for many years already, and he asked me to join him for one year in Romania because he was able to get the cavalry of Ceausescu for filming the first Italian campaign and the Russian campaign. But the whole thing didn't happen. I went to England uh, for pre-production, preparing things, got all ready, but then MGM pulled out. And uh, there may be multiple reasons. Uh, one certainly is because Dina De Laurentiis had a co-production uh, lined up. It was a uh, French, American, Soviet co-production on a film called Waterloo with Rod Steiger. And I'm quite sure that uh, that, that, that was not very appealing <laughs> to MGM to then have Kubrick follow with uh, a related film later. Kubrick was very sad for two weeks, but life had to go on. And um, I was ready to go back to Zurich or Frankfurt, but he asked me to stay with him and try something else. And uh, my wife loved England. That was also a very important point for me. And one of the first things I did was buying the rights to Eyes Wide Shut, which uh, turned out to be in 1970, the very first signed and sealed contract Kubrick had with Warner Brothers. That was the beginning. Stanley decided against it. He pulled out. It was just too difficult for him. He didn't know exactly where to go. Uh, he loved the story, he loved the book, and he was determined to somehow do this. But uh, it was too early, so he did then uh, A Clockwork Orange. And this is your first screen credit as well, right? Yes. As, as assistant? As, as assistant. Yeah. Assistant to the Something director. Something like that, yeah. As assistant to the director, what were your roles? on Clockwork Orange. Oh, on Clockwork Orange, I basically learned film production is, is a, a logical manufacturing process and has very little to do with art. The art needs to be brought in through artists, through writers and a director and actors and designers. They bring the art into it. The process of doing it is a logical process. You have to get the right things at the right place at the right time for the right price. And my, my own role at that point was really to learn. Oh, I was involved in music. Yes, that's true. And getting some rights to music. Beethoven symphonies were necessary and you can't uh, record this. It's a huge orchestra, choir, four soloists. We only needed four minutes. You know, it's just out of the question because Kubrick also wanted very, very good quality. We had to buy this and that was not that easy because of union problems and all kinds of things. But finally, we got it from Deutsche Grammophon because they had a, an old mono recording, superbly done with Ferenc Fritschai conducting uh, the Berlin Philharmonics. It was no longer in their catalog because the stereo LP was already you know, the thing of the day. And so this wasn't even released anymore, but Clockwork Orange is a mono film. It's a mono mix. So it, it made no difference to us. Yeah, I got that very cheaply. It was very good. I enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah, we had to watch the money. That's an interesting point that, the, that Clockwork Orange is in mono because in, in 1970, at that point, stereo film had already become the standard. So well, why, why did he choose to shoot it in mono? Semi-standard. Stanley wasn't too happy with the idea of having an optical soundtrack in stereo. Uh, he, he listened to, to several um, examples and he felt it was, at that point, more of a limitation. Oh. From Barry Lyndon onwards, everything was in stereo. One of the many groundbreaking elements of the film, A Clockwork Orange, is the soundtrack, which is done by Wendy Carlos. How did Kubrick discover Wendy Carlos? Did you have a role in that? No, no, not at all. He discovered the uh, switched-on Bach, 
and he loved it. And it was a new sound. Since Clockwork Orange is a futuristic film, we needed futuristic elements like sets, costumes, etc., and also music. And it suited him extremely well. And we hired Randy Carlos to do these distortions on the, on, on a Moog synthesizer. And not Bach at all, but uh, Rossini and the Wilhelm Tell Overture and all this. And uh, it was very, very successful. I think she did a brilliant job. She was what you call a switcher, you know. In other words, uh, she brought something onto the table and after that certain areas of music went into a different direction. And uh, this is what artists often do and they come with something new that wasn't there before. Did the relationship continue between Kubrick and Wendy Carlo? Absolutely, because we also hired her for The Shining. The opening, this wonderful opening, which is the Diazire from the Symphonie Fantastique by Berlioz. It's the da 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 di da 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 you know, That was totally on, the, uh, on a synthesized instrument and it, it opens the film beautifully. Kubrick is so uh, equated with groundbreaking use of film music. I guess to me, the film that, that he first does this in is 2001. 2001 is really absolutely new. And um, one of the things that I brought to him, and I don't take any credit for it, it's just pure coincidence, is Thus Spoke Zarathustra. He, he asked me, he had already a track, which was perfectly fine. Uh, it was much more space music, much more modern and so, but uh, he didn't really love it. It was necessary that he did. I, I, was, I came from Zurich with a stack of LPs with all kinds of, you know, Mahler and Holst and Beethoven and Wagner and Dvorak and Bruckner and you name it. And one of the things was Richard Strauss, Das Buchs Artistra. He loved already the title. And he used it then. Well, yeah, it was pure coincidence, but yeah, many, many things are coincidence because you look, you look, and you look for all kinds of sources and then you find. Much more interesting in a way is the use of Johann Strauss, namely the little blue Danube. That was entirely his slow process of changing what he had already. There was already a cut version of this whole sequence with a different track. And uh, it was perfectly fine, yeah, but uh, he, he didn't really like it enough. And then he tried this, yeah, walls. And I know from Ray Lovejoy, who was the editor, that they were all at first very, very worried about it because, I mean, that doesn't go with a space film. But, you know, in the end, Stanley decided it and uh, they had to recut the whole thing because the music was then used in completely. So you cut the image to the f music and not the other way around. And everything was turning to the walls. Uh -huh. And this one, two, three, one, two, three. And well, by now, you know, if you ask some people, they think the Blue Danube is space music. <laughs> yeah. So there you are. Right. I mean, up until this point with, uh, with filmmakers, the music would come way later. It would be after the film would be done that then, then the film would be scored and, yeah, and well, uh, but of course with this, starting with this film, then Kubrick's filmmaking, entire sequences are structured by the music. You always considered music as early as possible. Not everything. Certainly there are moments when you do things in post-production. I mean, it's not, it's, not a, it's not cut in stone, but important music in the film is decided well before or during the filming. For example, in Eyes Wide Shut, Walls in a Minor Key, yeah, that, that, that main theme, that was decided long, long before. This afternoon when we watched your documentary, uh, Stanley Kubrick, A Life in Pictures, one of the things that, that I didn't know about and was very interested in was Kubrick's uh, taking a role in the marketing of uh, clock, starting with A Clockwork Orange. The advertising campaign for that film is so different from all the advertising of the other yeah. films. He would listen, certainly, to the experts that Warner Brothers had, but he wanted to have a say too. He also was flexible. For example, on, on The Shining, we had this uh, Saul Bass uh, design in yellow and black, which I think is very, very stylish, but since the film came out first in America and it didn't really do well, 
then it was decided for the rest of the world, the release, not to have this fancy design, but to have a much clearer seeing Jack Nicholson, you know, saying, here's Johnny, you know, and recognize him. And that was considered more appropriate. Uh, I can't, I'm not a marketing expert, so, but that's what they decided. And then Stanley worked with them. Of course, he wasn't stubborn. You know, Warner Brothers thought this would be much better for the rest of the world, and so they did. But by now, the film is a classic and it's very much loved but at the time when it came out, it, it wasn't really that successful. Speaking of films that came out and were, were greeted with critical distance, uh, Barry Lyndon was the first film that you received a producer credit on. How did you move up from assistant uh, to the director to getting a producer's credit? Well, I on almost the film? did the same thing. I learned a little bit more what the, the film industry, in this respect, the production process, the what I call the manufacturing process, is really not different from, from any, any other process. You, know, you need artists, but I have nothing to do with that. I'm not a filmmaker. Barry Lyndon, I, all I did was getting permissions and getting rights and planning aspects and money things, you know, making deals. That's what I did, and that's what I did uh, all the way through to eyes wide shut. My role was to identify with the aim of what the filmmaker wants and to offer options, get it as cheaply as, and as quickly as possible. Giving options was very important. Yeah. Also in music, what I did on the side was always suggesting music in case of Barry Lyndon. Not deciding, but it, making many suggestions. And then he fell in love with something which uh, was not necessarily even absolutely right. For example, in, in Barry Lyndon, he loved the Schubert trio. Well, that was out of time. That was 30 years later. Mm. He said, oh, well, I mean, yeah, I like it so much, and he used it. So he wasn't stubborn. What was, what was guiding it was not only whether it was right, but how much he liked it. I respected that very much. His love of Barry Lyndon, at least how it came across, in your documentary was the realism of that film, the capturing of that time period in sure. the costumes, in the sets, in the photography. I mean, literally inventing a camera lens to be able to, photog uh, to photograph. What he wanted to do is show the lighting with candles, because we know this from the paintings. There are loads of wonderful paintings from the time, and we can see how candles are so much in the center and he wanted to get that atmosphere on the screen. That you can only do by not using a lot of fill light. And if you want to get the exposure of his candles, you need a very fast lens. In a magazine called The American Cinematographer, he found this lens, which was a, a product bought by NASA for satellite photography. We managed to get a, a camera adapted to take this lens. In the end, he succeeded in uh, yeah, creating the atmosphere that we know from the paintings. It was difficult for the actors because they had to be totally stable and they, if they moved like that, you know, the focus puller had to follow. Very tricky business. Well, you know the film and it looks fantastic and it was very difficult to do. The candles also had three wicks and they were very hot and they burned very fast. So now you have to watch that the continuity is correct. Because right. so the candles you know, the are You can't have the candles going up and down. Yeah. Yeah. This is all, all, all very, very difficult. It was a real pain, but yeah, that's what he wanted. And so he very often was in technical areas at the, at the edge. Also, in a way, this wonderful invention by Gareth Brown, the Steadicam, he really put it on the map in, in The Shining. So with The Shining, he wanted the camera to move a certain way. He wanted it to be on the level of, of Danny, the five-year-old boy. Garrett Brown was able to do that. He's a real technical guy, brilliant operator, brilliant inventor. The idea is not only to follow the little boy, because you can't do that with a dolly, yeah? But you can move around, you can go upstairs. Yeah, that, that was tricky. For that, we would have news a crane otherwise, you know, with a long arm. All that is so expensive and cumbersome. I wanted to, to uh, ask you about Kubrick's obsessive nature. This is something that a number of people commented about in your film. I think obsessive is not a negative thing. I think it is somebody be called a perfectionist, it's a compliment. And so people always say he was obsessive, he was such a perfectionist, as if this was something bad. He was incredibly self-critical and careful and wanted to do something that is really right and remains. And, you know, 
all his films remain. N nothing disappears. I mean, from The Killing to Path of Glory to Lolita, so, uh, 2001, all these films are with us and they will be there for our next generation. I mean, this is fantastic. Yeah, Claude Monet did 250 paintings of water lilies, right? Was he obsessive about water lilies? I suppose so, yeah? He certainly loved it or he wouldn't have done it. And in different lights and morning and afternoon, oh, all the time. And I think this makes an artist. Also a mark of great artists, I think, is that they respect others. And Stanley so respected other filmmakers that did things that he couldn't do, that were different in style, and he loved it. He was a great fan of, of, of E.T. <laughs> he loved Carlos Saura. He loved Edgar Wright. He, he loved Woody Allen. I mean, he thought Radio Days was such a wonderful film, etc., etc. So this is all part of it. And there are many parallels. I mean, Mozart adored Bach, and Beethoven um, loved Mozart, etc., etc., etc. Richard Wagner copied by hand the scores of Beethoven's symphony to get a little bit nearer into this uh, genius. So what I want to say is, the greater the artist, the more respect for others. I have a, a, a quote here from Kubrick from, from 1980. He said, the 19th century was the golden age of realistic fiction. The 20th century may be the golden age of fantasy. And I was wondering that now that we are 17 years into the 21st century, if you had any thoughts on what this century might be the golden age of. I, I can't say. I think uh, had Kubrick lived, he would have totally concentrated on politics. All his films deal with politics, not directly. I mean, not like uh, the war films, obviously, but he was interested in human nature and how human nature develops, and he was critical of human nature. One of the typical things he said is, we are kidding ourselves if we believe that we are governed by our intellect or by our education and knowledge. No, when it really matters, we are all governed by our emotions. And he wouldn't exclude himself from this verdict. That is in interested him. And he would have now very much, I'm absolutely convinced, um, made a film focusing on, on the political development of the world, of the shrinking globe, the instant communication that we now have. That's totally new. The fact that everybody walks around with a phone in his hand and, and can communicate to the world, he hasn't experienced that. That would have totally fascinated him because he was also a gadget man. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I'm absolutely convinced of that. By this century, it would be the shrinking world and problems we will have in this overpopulated little, tiny little globe that we couldn't even perceive before. And um, since I have seven grandchildren, uh, that worries me a little bit. Eyes Wide Shut comes, came out in 1999, just at the, the very end of the 20th century. In the documentary, a couple people spoke towards Christian, his, his wife, your sister, uh, spoke to him being looking forward to the future and more projects. And can you tell us a bit about what what could have been? He always wanted to make a film about the Holocaust. He had two big run-ups and failed for different reasons. It's a very, very much a political film, right? He, he would stay with this and not necessarily do the Holocaust film, not necessarily do AI, which had already offered to Steven Spielberg while he was alive. But there were some other pet projects in his head. I think they would all have been out of the window and he would have come up with something brand new, more up to date and more dealing with how the world has changed. It's completely different problems. And I think he would have focused on that. You are uh, the person who's been really in charge of making sure Kubrick's legacy continues. We created an, a big exhibition that travels the world. It was also in Los Angeles a few years ago. It's right now in Copenhagen. We then go to Frankfurt and Barcelona and what have you. And we have now 1.2 million visitors. So I'm, I'm very proud of being part of that. Then the wonderful uh, publishing house Taschen did several books. And another book is coming out in the spring on Dr. Strangelove 
that's, that will be absolutely amazing. Yeah? But also these books that exist on his archive on 2001, the whole Napoleon archive has been presented by a fantastic book by Taschen. And um, I work at film schools all around the globe. I had a, the greatest teacher one could have. The archive of his work is amazing. Was this part of his control that he was keeping every every letter, every photograph, every everything? Or did you have a role no, in that as no, well? No, not at all. When this whole thing came up after his death, nobody talked about it. He didn't leave instructions what to do with his stuff, right? Then uh, we thought, what, what, what should happen? And the Film Institute in Frankfurt, they were the first who came to us and suggested that we do an exhibition on Stanley Kubrick. We were first very hesitant. Why, why Frankfurt? I mean, it should be New York or it should be London. But nobody came from New York or London, but Frankfurt pushed. And the federal government of Germany said, look, this guy, never mind whether he's American or not, he's a world artist. He's like Picasso, yeah? So we, 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 are, we are backing you. Yeah, and, and the federal government backed the Film Institute because it's an expensive thing. They send us an expert for almost a year to go through this stuff. His widow considered, would Stanley want this? And then she looked at three big trunks labeled Dr. Strangelove. She remembered these trunks. They traveled the ocean twice. And another hundreds of boxes labeled with the film titles. Has Stanley kept all this for her to throw it away? No. She and her daughters, and I was myself, was also involved. We clearly decided that this would not be the right thing, but we should very, very carefully take out everything that was somehow personal, but the professional stuff that was there should be used. And we used it in two ways. First, we built the exhibition, which travels the world, but you know, there's so much more. And the rest was given to the University of the Arts in London, and they house now the Stanley Kubrick archive. And eventually, one day, everything will go to the University of the Arts in London. Throughout his life, Kubrick often attributed his skills as a filmmaker to his two early passions and jobs. Number one, as photographer for Look magazine, and number two, as a professional chess player. As a yeah. youngster, as a youngster he played chess and sometimes he played chess for quarters. The Look magazine thing, that's much more important because he did thousands of photographs. And in fact, next year, the uh, Museum of the City of New York will launch an exhibition with the look photographs. That will be a real first. I was wondering if you knew of anything else from his early life that maybe he left out that, well, that also contributed to him. He being. was a drummer in a jazz band. I mean, he was an amateur. He was not a professional, but he loved music and he loved jazz and he loved being active. He had a big drum set and that's what he liked. Yeah, so that's also important. And he loved sports. Not active, but watching it. <laughs> he played table tennis, but that's something else. No, but really the, 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 the Look magazine part, I have to emphasize, that is really very relevant. That was one of my favorite parts of the film, actually, was the clips of his early photographs. Well, I want to thank you, Jan. It's a pleasure. I love talking about Stanley, and um, so it's easy. <laughs> Para crear un nuevo sistema moderno y eficaz que ya se entiende por todas partes.